Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Aussie's Intelligent Corporation Group. We're really excited to have Jules ahead here today. I met you about a year ago, maybe a little less, at a really wonderful in-person workshop hosted by Divya and a few others. And we discussed basically like better institution design. And you basically talked to me about compositional game theory. And I asked a bunch of questions. I thought it was incredibly interesting, especially because it fits uh, in the intelligent corporation paradigm of this group, but especially in the multipolar kind of paradigm uh, that we have in our AI grant. So I, I was dying to hear more about it and it took us about a year, but um, now we finally have you with us for a seminar, um, hopefully uh, eventually soon also for an in-person uh, visit, but really exciting stuff. Uh, you will tell us a lot more, I, or I guess a little bit about what composition game theory is, but instead of telling us, you also show us what it can do and possible implications what it has for other fields, in particular, yeah. something called categorical cybernetics. So with that, uh, I will share more info about you in the chat. But for now, thank you so much for joining. I've been waiting for this for quite some time and I'll be monitoring questions in the chat. Thanks a lot. Okay, yeah. thanks. I'm Thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to finally be here. And yes, I hope like sometime this year, I'll actually make it to San Francisco. I'm just really busy, as you might see. So... I'm going to talk mostly about compositional game theory in a, in a non-technical. So th this is going to be a non-technical introduction because 40 minutes just is not enough for a technical introduction. So I can either tell you the whole of something useful or a little part of something useful. So I chose to tell you the whole of something useful. So roughly this will be three parts. I'm going to give you a kind of conceptual, mostly hand-waved introduction to what compositional game theory is. Then I will show you basically what we're doing with it. And then I'll talk a bit about the bigger picture. This is the, so the final part is like the current status of research. And all of this is going to be very conceptual, but it's going to be an invitation to, to dive into more, more technical material that we have. Okay. And there's lots of people involved in this. Here is, so I'll be talking about some of these people and some of these, some of these groups at various points, but let's get into, I don't have, so 40 minutes is not very long. And in fact, maybe it's more like 35 minutes now. Um, so this is not a super long time. Um, so let's dive into it. So I'm hoping that most people here know a little bit about game theory, even if not uh, in technical detail, then at least of the idea of what it is. But here's my take on what game theory is. It is a mathematical tool. It comes from microeconomics, and it is a tool for building models of the strategic interaction of rational agents. And those are technical terms. So rational means roughly that all of these agents are receiving numerical quantitative payoffs and they're acting in a way in order to perfectly maximize those payoffs. Strategic means that they basically form plans. They're not winging it. They, they form kind of formal plans and we're judging the optimality of those formal plans. So game theory constitutes basically an extremely powerful way of modeling incentives and how incentives of different agents interact with each other. Game theory is applicable, is, is very useful in very specific situations. If you try to apply it all over the place, like economists were trying to do back in the 90s, you will have a bad time. So, for example, game theory really relies on the facts that everybody is strictly conforming to a fixed interaction protocol of I move, then you move, and that type of thing. And more freeform situations, situations are just out of scope. And also rationality and Nash equilibrium are just incredibly strong assumptions that are only valid for human beings in extremely specific situations. For example, in market equilibria, it's a reasonable approximation. One thing that's notable about game theory is that it's the theoretical foundation of mechanism design and auction theory, which are famously the most empirically successful branch of economics. Okay. So here's how game theory is kind of traditionally done. So we draw pictures that look like this. They're tree shaped, and of course, everybody draws trees upside down. So, oh, I don't have a mouse pointer. Okay, because Apple is amazing. Okay, I don't know what I can do about that. Um, I already unfull screened and refull screened multiple times, and I still don't have a mouse pointer. So, I think I'm just going to have to to wing it. You could, yeah, you can explain to us, or there's, I think, the Zoom tool for that as well. But we can Ooh. see. Yeah, I'm also not set up with my iPad. I'm afraid, so I can't draw. Okay, it'll be fine. I'll just explain it in words and hand gestures. Um, this tree is explaining how the play can unfold. So it's like the game starts in this initial state and imagine dropping a marble in the top and it falls down. It takes, either goes left or right at each stage, except that instead of being random, if you're dropping a marble at each point where it could go left or right, there are some agents deciding whether to go left or right. And when it reaches the bottom, you get some payoff vector and the agents are choosing in a way to optimize that payoff vector. 
There's another representation, which is normal form games, which are super useful for calculation, but are conceptually completely opaque. Here's a thing that I found with Google Images, and I literally don't know what it means. It's just a bunch of numbers. Like this matrix of numbers tells me absolutely nothing about the situation that this is modeling. So there's a kind of close analogy here to, to programming, to software. The thing on the left is Hello World Enterprise Edition, which is a joke at Java's expense. But there's a serious thing behind the joke, which is that like in, in software engineering, there's all of these, there's like a whole bunch of tools, rules of thumb, best practices for building things that scale. And this was just unbelievably successful. Software engineering um, is able to basically handle code bases that are tens of millions of lines of code and things go wrong often, but not as often as they would if they didn't have these kind of tools for sure. And then on the right, this is what, this is a low level representation. So this is the computer code equivalent of a bimatrix game. It's just like a bunch of ones and zeros. It's completely unstructured. Now, compositional game theory takes a completely different, it's a bit like extensive form games, but different. There's a different perspective on, on what games can be. And the key analogy is that we think of games as processes. It's a process which is going to transform an initial state to a final state. Uh, so we have an hour of time here going from left to right. I think my camera's reversed, so I think that's left and that's right, hopefully. Um, so we have some kind of it, some kind of before state, and then some stuff happens in a black box, and then we get a new state. And inside this black box, anything could happen. And specifically, we don't care what happens. So this might not even be a game, right? This could be a completely computational process with no rational agents at all, or just like some computation happening deterministically. There could be one player in there who is optimizing something, or there could be 20 players in there who are optimizing something. The other thing, so in order to transform an initial state into a final state, the other piece of data we need is a bunch of strategies. So a strategy for a player is basically telling them how to transform from what they can see into what they can do. When I teach game theory, I just hammered it. I hammer them over the head with this idea over and over again. A strategy is a rule that tells you how to take, how to get from what you can see to what you can do. So given a strategy, which comes in from the side, then we transform an initial state into a final state. Okay. Now the complication of this is the games are not just simple processes like that, but they're what I call bi-directional processes, which means that we also have, have some information that appears to counter flow to time. So the order that things happen in this diagram is incredibly specific. So we have an initial state. Oh, the thing I forgot to mention is that um, we can string these things together end to end. So the final state of some process can be used as the initial state of another process. So we can string these together. That's very important. Um, so you can build bigger processes from smaller processes compositionally. Okay. Now we also have this bidirectional information flow because, because these so are Yep. Sorry, Jules, uh, yeah. could, could you just give us a really simple example of what you mean by composing? What are two different things that could be put to get strung together like that? For example, so the simplest thing would be to say that we have one box contains one player and the next box contains one other player who can see and react to what the first player did. So that's um, sequ sequential composition in time of two players. Uh, I'll, I'll give more examples of this later. Uh, um, we also, so as well as this forward information flow of transforming, uh, initial game state into a later game state, we also have to worry about payoffs because, um, it's the nature of a rational player that they, they are acting in a way that will optimize some value that hasn't been determined yet. They're, they're reasoning forwards in time in order to optimize some future value, which is their payoff. So the idea is that we have we have what I call downstream payoffs, which are coming from the future. These are the things that our players in the box care about, but which might depend on things in the future. For example, the move of some future player. And in return, this is where things get really subtle. In return, we have to return payoffs further upstream, which can be the payoffs for players who move before us. Okay. Now, this might, this probably sounds completely mysterious. And that's okay. It's not the purpose of this talk to explain how open games work. I'm just going to show you both, like, this is as much as I want to show you of, of how they work. So I can ask what's in the box. So each box contains a bundle of three pieces of data, but I, I want to skip this for time. I, I don't actually want to tell you about this. 
I will happily talk about this after the talk, or I can link to lots of papers that talk about this. Um, using this, we can draw circuit diagrams for games. So this is an example of a bimatrix games. For example, so this is every bimatrix game, depending on which functions you plug in. So for example, Prisoner's Dilemma has this form. So what this is, two players who are moving in parallel and the air gap, this is where I wish I had a mouse pointer, in between the two triangles are the two players and in between them, there's an air gap. What that means is that they're simultaneous in time. Neither player can see what the other are doing. Um, then we have a payoff function. So the, the box label Q is the payoff function. Payoff function depends on bo what both players did. That's X1 and X2. And it returns a pair of numbers. And those pair of numbers get wired back to the two players where the first player is optimizing the first number and the second player is optimizing the second number. Uh, so even if you didn't understand everything I said before, Hopefully you can see that this makes sense as a kind of circuit diagram for a game like Christmas Dilemma. Now, so this was a game where two players move uh, simultaneously. If we want to talk about sequentially, we have to actually manually wire it up. So here we have player one moves, player one chooses a move, which I call X. We copy it. One copy gets observed by the second player. And then the second player uses that observation to choose their move, which is Y and Y together with the other copy of X that we had hanging around and fed to them. And then we can, once we have this, we can just start to build more complicated examples. So this is now a three player game, um, which is a hybrid of sequential and simultaneous. So this is uh, one player who is upstream, who makes a move, which is then observed by two players downstream who move simultaneously to each other. So for example, this is the basic structure of a simple economic model where you have an upstream monopolist and then a downstream duopoly. And you can really push this far. So this is taken from a paper that I have with, with Seth, Seth Frey and Josh Tan and Philip Zahn. So we took an example from Eleanor Ostrom's work where she describes this case study of, I think these are farmers in Nepal, if I remember correctly. And this was about, this was about an institution that was built around taking water out of an, water out of an irrigation channel. And we built basically a game theoretic model of this situation where, so the game theoretic situation is that each player would like to take more water than they should. But if everybody does that, then there's, then the, then the bottom plots become dry. And, and we found that you can build models of this that actually mirror the physical structure of the, of the irrigation channel where water is flowing along these wires from upstream to downstream. So that was cool. For most of this talk, I'm, so this is the only example where I'm really talking about institution stuff, because when I was making the slides, it turned out that the, the blockchain smart contract stuff that we were doing was just like better developed. This is the institution design stuff is, is in a more preliminary state. So I'm not talking about it quite as much. I don't, that might be the wrong thing for the wrong audience, but this is just the slides that I happen to make. Um, okay. I haven't yet said the words category theory. So in the background here is a branch of pure mathematical category theory, which comes from topology and is something like a general mathematical theory of composition. If you've heard of it, there's a good chance it was through functional programming. If you hang around in San Francisco, I'm sure you hear about this sometimes. It also has cropped up in quantum computing and data migration and a few other kind of applied fields. And it turns out that this, this mathematical machinery is just the right tool for the job. If you want to think of games as processes, we can build on a lot of work by a lot of very smart people. My role in this, I, I see myself as a kind of bridge between the pure mathematicians and the applied economists. I'm not the greatest at either of them, but I know enough about both of them that I can tra translate between these two worlds. That's, I built my career on being this kind of halfway point in this field. Okay. So I am now 15, a little bit more than 15 minutes. Okay. So I'm already running a little bit behind, which is great. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. Okay. Only take <laughs> I haven't timed this talk yet. I wrote these slides at the end of the day for me, the sun just went down, but I wrote these slides this afternoon. Okay. So all of this was theory, but. So we built an implementation of this called the Open Game Engine. And the name of the Open Game Engine is a joke on game engines. It is a domain-specific programming language, which means it's not a, a, as opposed to a general purpose programming language. So it's a programming language specifically designed for building game, game theoretic models. It's embedded inside a host language. The host language we use is a language called Haskell, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's a pretty niche language. I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide. What it is in practice, so in computer science terminology, I would call this a model checker. A model checker is a, this is a thing from software verification, 
It is a bug finding tool. Model trackers are bug finding tools that basically explore every possible execution of, of a piece of code using extremely advanced techniques, right? This makes it sound simpler than this. They explore the kind of execution space of code in order to find bugs. So what this is, is not a tool for solving Nash equilibria. It's a tool for checking Nash equilibria. In other words, we input a game and a bunch of strategies and it will say either, yes, these strategies form a Nash equilibrium or no, they don't. And if it's no, they don't, then we'll get back detailed kind of debugging information about who deviates and why, what they could see, what the payoff they got was, how they could have got a high payoff, that type of thing. Um, of course, everybody wishes that they could actually solve Nash equilibria, but that's MP hard. Um, a, you can't do this no matter how smart you are. Basically what we found. This is one of our unique things, I think, is we realized that a lot of important economic problems can actually be solved if you loop an equilibrium check over a whole bunch of parameters. So an example of, of a question you can answer by looping an equilibrium check over a bunch of parameters is something like, under what range of market conditions are my token holders incentivized to defend my peg? Uh, so this is for each given value of some parameters, you have some kind of game theoretic problem, and then you would have a strategy or a, a family of strategies, which, which constitutes defending your peg. And then we run the equilibrium check and either you will find yes or no, because we can do better by doing something else. And if you loop that over a whole bunch of parameters, then you will end up with a range of market parameters, which might be exactly the thing you want. So I need to tell you the bad news. So this is open source. So in theory, you can download and play with this thing right now. Unfortunately, we're mired in technical debt. I wish you didn't have to know Haskell, but as of right now, if you have never used Haskell, you will probably have a bad time. Basically what happened is this thing grew from a research prototype and we began life as a bunch of academics who discovered the hard way why industry doesn't use Haskell more. So at the moment we're trying to get funding to basically rebuild the whole thing from scratch in Python, which will come with, so Python comes with its own problems, but at least they're problems that people know and understand. And what we think is that what we'd call game theoretic programming, building game theoretic models in a domain specific programming language is always going to be difficult because game theory is difficult. Game theory is difficult. Programming is difficult. That combination is difficult, but right now it's even harder than it needs to be. Okay. So here is an example of, of what code in the open game engine looks like. So this is a toy example. This is the ultimatum games. If you know elementary game theory, you've definitely heard of this example. So here we have basically two players. One is called the proposer. So the proposer moves first and offers a split of a pie. But the proposer cuts the pie and says, I get this bit, you get this bit. And the responder who moves second observes what the proposer proposed and can choose either to accept the proposal or reject the proposal. And if the, if the responder rejects it, then both players get nothing. And if they accept it, then they both get that slice. So here's the labeled version. So I wanted to talk through what this is doing so you can look at it before I add all the labels, because otherwise this is a very noisy slide. And again, I wish I had a mouth pointer. Um, there's a lot of detail here. So the two key lines are the ones which are labeled operation. So there's one operation, something proposer, and one operation, something responder. These are player one's choice and player two's choice. So these two blocks of five lines correspond to what player one does and then what player two does. So you can see we are giving player one's action space and then we are introducing a variable, which is called proposal and that, and player one's move, which we don't know, right? That depends on what happens during the execution of this game, but whatever it is, it gets bound to a variable called proposal. And then that ends up being the input to player two's decision. So it's just a programming methodology, a, this kind of strategic choice is a thing that you can do in this programming language, like a bit like inputting from a terminal or reading from a file, it's a strategic choice. You stuff that into a variable and then you can pass it to other people. And the other funky thing is that on the last line of player one's block, which says returns open game payoff, ultimatum game payoff proposer. So that is player one's payoff function. And that depends on a value called reaction and reaction is a future value because reaction is players two's decision. And that has not come into existence yet because player two moves after player one. So here you can see the subtlety that player one is optimizing a value that just doesn't exist yet. Um, um, 
the scoping rules of this language are quite complicated because some variables behave normally as you expect if you've ever programmed in any language ever, but some variables go backwards in time, which is very strange. Okay. So this is, this is the compositional game theory equivalent of enterprise edition. Hello world. This is using, this is using very powerful machinery to do a toy example in pure math. We call this nuking a mosquito. So here's a real example. So 20 squares, which is um, a startup who I'm involved with had a consulting project with a project called BlockSwap. And we were modeling um, something called a proof of neutrality protocol, which is a proposed addition to the Ethereum uh, proof of stake protocol. Um, so we have uh, existing roles called uh, builder, relayer, and validator. And the proposal was to add a fourth role called reporter. Um, and the idea was that the reporter was going to be paid or incentivized directly by the protocol in order to uh, monitor the other agents taking part in the protocol and, and report misbehavior in a way that could be independently validated. So we used the open game engine to build a model of this and basically discovered um, that there are misaligned incentives in this protocol. So cases where the uh, reporter is not incentivized to tell the truth. And then we use the open game engine to basically build and bundle a interactive model that can be shipped to the client. And here is just a small part of it. So this is now a real model. So this is a few pages of code and here's just part of it. This is, this is basically the reporter's decision, which is built from several parts. And along the top, you can see a whole bunch of hyperparameters because real models involve lots and lots of hyperparameters. If you've ever seen any economics, you have lots of hyperparameters. We can't get away from it. And the other thing that's difficult is, so the open game engine domain specific language is for building games, but the other key thing is building strategies because I said we are equilibrium checking strategies. So you supply a game and you supply a strategy and then you get debugging results and strategies we're a bit behind in the technology. So strategies are built in raw Haskell, and this is really unpleasant. Uh, this is in practice, I think maybe on the next slide, I, no, in a couple of slides, I'll talk about it, but actually building strategies to check for equilibriumness is actually in practice, our main scale barrier now. Okay. So the previous thing was a real model, but it is something that didn't actually require compositional game theory. There were four players in this model, so it would be unpleasant to do the old way, but possible, totally possible. Then we get into stuff that you really need compositionality. This is, we're getting into stuff now that just you cannot do otherwise. I'm not going to talk much about this, but Fabrizio, a colleague of mine was doing a bunch of work on what's called recursive auctions. So these are settings where you are bidding in an auction for the right to become the auctioneer in a sub auction. And auctions are really complicated, right? Even simple auctions are really complicated to understand game theoretically. Okay. And the code for this, yeah, Fab was using, using the open game engine just to help him explore how these things behave. Okay. Where am I for time? That's about right. So with this, because we have a programming language in principle, we have no scale, we have no scalability barrier. In principle, we could build the equivalent of a 10 million line code base. Unfortunately, building models is not enough, right? We want to also do equilibrium checks with them. And the main um, scalability barrier is actually finding reasonable strategies to test. So we find that for kind of maximally heterogeneous models where no two players have anything at all in common, by the time you get to around 10 players, this is really difficult. It's just too much stuff. Uh, so this is, so we scale, let's say quite a lot more than, than could be done previously. This is the state of the art by some way, but we hit another scalability barrier. This one doesn't feel like a hard scalability barrier. It feels like this feels like a kind of stupid thing. It's, it seems so much simpler than the problems we've solved already, but we're currently stuck on this. We also have one other barrier, which is computational, which is that if you're checking Bayesian, so for pure trashy Nash, um, things are fine. Um, but in practice, if you're doing, um, auction theory, you really need what's called Bayesian Nash equilibrium. I'm not going to go into what these are. Um. But it turns out the equilibrium checking Bayesian Nash equilibria is actually exponentially hard just to check them because of basically custom dimensionality. Um, uh, this is doing a or computing a Bayesian posterior on a on a joint distribution with n variables in it is exponentially difficult. Um, anyway, um, I'll show you some advanced features um, that the Open Game Engine has, um, and this is related to 
um, why it's actually such a pain for a casual user to play with because these things are forced on you by default. Uh, so we have a, for, for the difficulty of Bayesian Nash equilibrium checking, we have a Bayesian Monte Carlo optimizer, uh, which, which buys you a couple of orders of magnitude at least. Um, we have, because finding strategies to check for equilibriumness, uh, I'm determined that equilibriumness is a word, by the way, it's a really useful word to use if you're a game theorist, the property of either being or not being in equilibrium. Um, because finding strategies to test is really difficult. So we're really interested in basically strategy learning, using techniques to, to explore the search space of strategies. And the obvious thing to use for that is reinforcement learning. So we, we have a kind of pipe between the open game engine and some reinforcement learning stuff in Python. Uh, so this was used, um, uh, for a paper by Philip Zahn and some colleagues on, on algorithmic collusion, um, which is basically the, the question of whether interacting reinforcement learning agents, uh, playing pricing games, or in, in other words, choosing prices will converge to above Nash prices or not. Um, and then we've also integrated the open game engine with a tool called HEBM, which is an Ethereum virtual machine emulator itself written in Haskell. Uh, and the idea is that this, this should allow us to do semi-automatic verification of smart contracts. And this is economic verification, incentive testing. This part is finished, but not yet used for anything serious. Uh, so I'll get back to you on that in a few months. Okay. Let me talk. I have well five minutes and change. So let me talk a little bit about the big picture. So the previous stuff was what we are doing mostly at 20 squares. And now I want to talk about the research part rather than the applied economics part. So. The theoretical origins of computational game theory about nine years old, and it was purely mathematical research for a few years while we were figuring things out before we could apply it. And since that time, the mathematical foundations, I skipped over the slide telling you what an open game actually is, but that pattern on that slide that I skipped over <laughs> kept showing up in other places. First place it showed up, we realized that it is basically backdrop we realized that we had basically reinvented backdrop under a different name. Um, whereas in deep learning, you backpropagate deriv uh, derivatives, robust derivatives in computational game theory, you backpropagate payoffs, but the structure of what the backprop algorithm does, the, this kind of dance of forward pass and backwards pass is actually structurally the same. Then it turned out that the same thing happens in Bayesian inference. If you want to do Bayesian inference of a stochastic process, so in other words, if you have a prior on the input of a stochastic process and you make an observation of the output, then the, the question is, how do you get a posterior distribution on the input? It turns out that the structure of this is, is exactly the same. So in this case, we're not back propagating derivatives and we're not back, back propagating utilities. We're back propagating posteriors, Bayesian posteriors and Again, the mathematical structure turned out to be like exactly the same. This pattern just kept coming up. It came up again in optimal control theory in, in the Bellman equation, the way back propagate losses. And some people are not surprised by this. Some people know that all of these things are loosely related to each other. It comes up in reinforcement learning in two different places, which are, which is why I've written it's complicated. And then, and then there's a couple of, so all of those so far are basically branches of machine learning, at least if you consider Bayesian statistics a branch of machine learning. Um, but there's a couple of places in kind of other computer science that's nothing to do with machine learning that it also comes up, database theory and distributed programming. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I should have shown this slide a bit earlier. Um, but this is what, so I've taken the same picture of a black box with six legs, but just relabeled it for deep learning. So here we forward propagate input vectors to output vectors, and then we back propagate reverse derivatives on the output to reverse derivatives, reverse derivatives on the input. And meanwhile, we take in by the side, a bunch of parameters and we output to the side losses of those parameters, which is then used by gradient descent to update the parameters. And again, the arrow of time follows the forwards pass. So we're going from input to output. And the same thing happens in Bayesian inference where we have a prior coming in, we push forward the prior. So it's the input of a stochastic process goes to the output of a stochastic process. But then we make an observation of what the output actually was, and then we want to back it to a posterior. And in order to do that, we have some parameters because we're parameterizing. That's what variational inference means, that we're parameterizing an approximation of the Bayesian inverse. And then we, we send back some losses to an optimizer. 
so, and I could have made these pictures for more things, but like I'm running out of time, so it's okay. So we looked at this collection of topics and we said cybernetics. So if you don't know, so some people know this and some people don't know this, the meaning of the word cybernetics has completely drifted beyond recognition over time. Its original meaning in the 60s was something like control theory of complex systems. It never had a fixed definition. It was always a bit of a vibe, um, but roughly control theory of complex systems and also a kind of a, a strong sense of being interdisciplinary. So I associate this with a kind of academic golden age before we had siloing into different academic departments where computer scientists are strictly never allowed to talk to biologists. And then Doctor Who happened and there was the Cybermen and, and then Star Trek happened with the Borg and now everyone thinks that cybernetics means biotech. Cybernetics originally had nothing to do with biotech. So in fact, the word cyborg is a amalgamation of cybernetic, organic, cyborg. Okay, so we, we are, this is, we're, we're foolishly trying to reclaim the re original meaning of this word. It's extremely likely that the ship has sailed, but we're going to try anyway. So we think that basically this perspective using this new foundation, using category theory can lead to uh, a renaissance of the original dream of cybernetics, which really imploded in the seventies. Uh, roughly what happened is that researchers doing cybernetics wildly overclaimed what their field could do. And then everybody stopped believing it. And then it schismed into like control theory and complex systems theory and a bunch of other things. Machine learning, of course, right? AI came out of that as well. Um, um, Philip Zahn and me, and then we were joined by Oliver Beiger, decided that this idea was too important to be left to the crumbling universities. So we decided to form a, an independent kind of alt academic nonprofit, which is called the CyberCat Institute or the Institute for Categorical Cybernetics. So this has just been legally incorporated at the beginning of this year. So the idea is that this should be a home for public domain research and open source software development. We're trying to build a better university. We are definitely not the only people trying to build a better university, right? But we want to focus on this specific field. So our current status is that we're currently looking for funding as everybody is, of course. So we want to, we're, we're, we're focusing right now on four really major projects. We want to re-implement the open game engine. So we want to in Python build a new thing, which is going to be a test bed for all exploring all of these things. And also as a key design principle, be possible for ordinary developers who just dabble to, to download this and play with it. Okay. And then. Basically everything else, all of the other applications are coming from here. We have a theory that can talk about all of these different things simultaneously. So what can we do by exploiting these pairwise bridges? For example, we have a theory that can talk simultaneously about things like game theory and preferences, but also talk about deep learning. For example, can we use this to say anything about AI safety? For example, we're interested in things like, can we develop algorithms that will learn while enforcing some kind of preference constraints, by which I mean, we enforce that at every stage of learning that the agent will make choices that conform to certain preference relations that we have fixed as designers. Another thing would be market design or market analysis applications. Um, using game theory, you can talk about markets. That's, that's what game theory was originally for. But we also have reinforcement learning, so we can talk about learning agents in markets. So interested in basically things like how do you approximate or to what extent can you approximate Nash equilibria? How do you study algorithmic collusion? This type of thing. And then, and then the idea of backpropagating Bayesian posteriors, this is actually really, it's not completely new, but very few people know this. And I think this is, that's a case where we have something that's really new enough that there could be something really ma major that could be literally a new branch of machine learning. Okay. And that is where I'll stop. So I'll end on this slide. This is just some places, some of the places that you can go to learn more. So I should now answer questions because I can see there's lots and lots of questions in the chat. Thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful. Thanks also a ton about sharing the possible like, fundraising requests. I could see that maybe also even being a fit for our AI safety grants in the multipolar category, but maybe we should chat a bit more uh, about that offline. Yeah. Um, maybe Jazia, do you want to ask your first question? And otherwise, feel free to raise your hand if you're interested in asking a question, because I can't tell from many of the questions in the chat if they are questions that are mostly related to people 
basically trying to make sense of the presentation as it goes along, or if there's any of them that are specifically focused um, on for Jules now. See so if you want to unmute, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'll read out your question. Hey, um, uh, great presentation. Um, I guess my, my question was, what kind of funding are you looking for? But maybe as a related question, um, I'm wondering to what degree you, if any, you talk in with the CAD guys or block science or have thought at all about how this work relates with agents that are created by large language models? Yeah. The answer to the second question is yes, we know at least one person at block science. Um, so yes, we are talking to them. Oops. I did not mean to unfull screen this. So agents, agents created or implemented by large language models is definitely something we're interested in. To some extent, this is jumping on a hype bandwagon. Like everybody, everybody wants LLMs right now, obviously, for obvious reasons. But yes, this is definitely something we're interested in. I, I don't have a theoretical take on generative transformers. Uh, I have not, or between us, we have not succeeded in fitting generative transformers into this worldview. I don't know whether it's possible or not. I hope it's possible. Um, that leaves us with basically simulating them, um, which is theoretically possible. Yes. Um, I think I said here, basically what type of funding we're looking for. So we're a nonprofit, we're incorporated in the EU, so we can't go for VC funding. We don't have a, we don't have a value proposition. We're applying for, we're applying for gov government grants like EU and that type of thing. Uh, we're applying for, um, philanthropic grants. We are looking for, in some cases, contracting some R and D from companies. That's a borderline case, whether we're even allowed to do this under our tax situation, but yeah, basically we need funding and we are open to literally everything. The question was how so much. Uh, yeah. Sorry. The question was also how much. How much money? How much have you got? Yeah. At the moment we, so <laughs> my immediate goal is to get enough funding to hire one person for one year. Um, but as I say, if I had a budget of 1 million, I know how I would spend it. Okay. That's useful. Yeah. Uh, we had all, I think plenty of people here would be looking forward to learning more in particular. And I must also check the email, but uh, we have a ton more questions in the queue. So let's see how many we'll get through. I think Micah was next. At the start of the talk, you hinted that game theory doesn't work well in the real world for very good reasons, like irrational yeah. humans, fuzzy rules, et cetera. Yeah. Later on, you describe using the tool for real world things though. Am I misunderstanding something or how do you support that? Yes. It is not that it's never useful. It's just that it's useful in very specific situations. So the idea is that we, so all of these are those specific situations where use, where it's useful. And this is where you need economists. So if it wasn't clear, I actually, I didn't say this. I hope it was clear. I'm not an economist. I'm a mathematician and computer scientist. Um, but really microeconomists learn this like deep intuition for when you can apply different kinds of models. Yeah, thanks. Okay. It doesn't show me who was in the queue first. So I'll just go yeah. via the top. We had David, then I think it was Richard, and then I think it was Mahan or maybe the other way yeah, around. I think, yeah, I, I think it actually has us in the order that we clicked on the thing, which would make Mahan after me, but it, I don't, it doesn't yeah, matter. So anyway, uh, Jules, um, this was awesome. Thank you so much. And I would be very excited to hear that you guys got a huge amount of funding. I feel like so there wait. are a bunch of places. There are a bunch of places that should be interested in giving an organization like yours money. But my question is about multi-level game theoretic models. So there, there's a bunch of work that I'm aware of actually in political science where they talk about, okay, so people vote for their, you know, their senator. And so you have coalitions of people who are voting for um, somebody. And then the senators form coalition to pass legislation. And that legislation does things like impact international um, treaties. There's many levels of this game where international relations really actually depends a huge amount on the Republicans are opposed to this now, as opposed to the United States is interested. Um, and so the question is, I had assumed initially that like that's the type of thing that compositional modeling does, and then you explained it. But could you use compositional modeling for that type of situation? And I'm aware that the way that it was, the way that people had explained this to me, and I think this makes a lot of sense, is game theory is often fragile. 
right? Yeah. It's not that it's not useful. It's just that if your payoffs change by, you know, 1%, then the solution changes completely. So that made it useless in cases where that can happen. But I, I am interested in like, how would you use it for this kind of multi-level situation if, if it wasn't useless? Yeah, that, that sounds to me like just the right kind of situation. Yeah. Where you have this, it's hierarchical composition. So you have a whole, you have a whole bundle of players, like a whole game theoretic process, which then you put in a box and it behaves like a single player from the perspective of, of a bigger game. Yeah, this is exactly the right thing. So I say this, that, that part of the literature is not something that I've seen, but I'm going to guess that at least one of my collaborators knows something about it, but I'd be be super happy to hear from you yeah. about so would you be able to put it into obviously right now being transitioned from you said haskell to python so like right now probably isn't the greatest time to do it but you'd be able to put it into the engine and yeah. run that okay that is yeah. awesome yeah the real problem i i think this is actually the the underlying reason why i didn't talk much about institutional stuff we have done institutional modeling i have one slide with with a nepalese irrigation system but it's just the nature of the thing that it needs to be quantitative and fully precise. And in almost all cases, you just don't want to go to that level of precision. Building, building a complete model may, forces you to make a lot of choices that can feel arbitrary that you don't want to make. But if you don't make those choices, you can't execute the model. You can't do equilibrium checking. So it's, what's the point? All right. Wonderful. Next one up, we have Mahan. Hey, Mahan, can you unmute? All right, then we go with Richard while Mahan is figuring out his unmute. Richard Mala, do you want to? Hi, Jules. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Can you speak to the possibility of implementing your engine on, let's say, a probabilistic programming language and whether that would help scalability in terms of numbers of players or other dimensions? Yeah, that's it's definitely a thing we would consider. Uh, so actually, uh, so at the moment, now I'm getting into extreme technicalities, but the, the Bayesian... Monte Carlo optimizer that I wrote is using a Haskell library called Monad Bayes, which actually is a probability programming domain specific language embedded in Haskell. Um, so yes, it is true that the machinery that a probabilistic programming language gives you would be useful for us. There are engineering details involved in this. Okay, cool. Lots more to discuss, I guess. <laughs> Next one up, we have Mahan. You can now unmute. I think you told me in the chat that you can. I'll try it now. Otherwise, feel free to just pop your question in the chat and I'm happy to. It, it's very answer. quiet. We can almost barely hear him, but not. I can't hear anything. Oh, I cannot. I cannot hear anything at all. Maybe David, you He's have really good. Good. <laughs> really good ears. Oh, okay. Mahan, maybe work with your volume. And in the meantime, I'll go to Luke if you. Oh, hey. Thank you. A really good presentation. I was wondering more about your like your application to like AI safety and how can, okay, so in your example for your, the like cryptocurrency stuff, you have an Oracle that you're like trying to, that is determining if there's like trust in your protocol. I wonder if you have any thoughts on if we can do this without having some sort of Oracle. Cause I was looking through your paper and then also through Hedges papers and having co-play with agents. I wonder if we can determine trust through co-play. That's a very difficult question for sure. Yeah, I don't think I can give a re, uh, kind of good answer to that question on the spot. Everything in AI safety is a super difficult research problem. All right. I hope also lots more topic for discussion afterwards. Next one up, we have Mark Miller. Do you want to unmute or should I? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Earlier, you mentioned derivatives and given the breadth of application of what you're talking right. about, it was completely unclear to me whether you meant derivatives as in calculus yes. or derivatives as in financial instruments. Ah, yeah, sorry. Yes, here are derivatives as, as in calculus. Okay. And I'll just, having reminded me about financial instruments, I'll just mention a weird coincidence, which is the payoff curve for the covered call option financial derivative is almost exactly the same as the ReLU curve in machine learning. Yes, that's... Yeah. Okay. It's basically flat and then linear, mm -hmm. except that with the call option, it's displaced downward by the constant factor of the call of the option. Yeah. As say, at some point during the process of all of these things happening, I stopped believing in coincidences. Um, 
It's who knows, but I know very little finance. I've only just started learning a tiny bit of basic finance. That was all I had. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for pointing out so many more interdisciplinary similarities here. I'm going to ask if you're from around, given that it's difficult for him to like properly unmute. I don't know, Jules, if you're familiar with Michael Levin's work, that's usually popping up in our biotech group, but basically Mahan is wondering if you have any thoughts about the formalizations of cybernetics for the nested intelligence or the collective intelligence that Michael Levin's working on with a cell-based kind of like xenobot child, uh, style in intelligence. I'm not sure if you know anything about his work. Yeah. If not, just drop you know, the question. I've, I've heard of it. Yeah. I came across the idea recently. Yeah. I, there is plausibly something there, but it's, yeah, I wouldn't want to commit to, <laughs> I would ever want to commit to saying there's definitely something there. Uh, this is definitely something I would be interested in talking about. Cool. I could definitely make it into a, a, a somebody or at least an opt-in request in case it's ever useful. Next one is Conway's Law applied to your organization <laughs> as a fun question. Wait, I don't remember what Conway's Law says. Please remind me. <laughs> Mahan, do you want to bring us properly up to date on this? Or is a business concept that reveals the connection between a company's internal structure and the result is still, uh, it delivers to the end users? Uh -huh. The core idea is that, that the way members of the organization communicate and collaborate will shape the design and character of the systems and projects it produces. So I guess, what is the kind of compositional game theory approach of the Cyber Cash Institute that you hope yeah. is fast? <laughs> okay, yes. At the moment, we at the moment we are legally incorpor legally incorporated, but I have no employees, including me or including the directors. I'll get back to you on that after we have some money. Uh, Great. And we'll be to do a meta. Yeah, yeah. sorry. At, 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 at the moment, we're an anarchist group. Nobody's in charge. Great. And I love those here. It would be fun to do a meta analysis eventually. Okay, yeah. Josiah, final question. You go. Yeah, I just wanted to tie a few things together. What is the Mike 11? Wide metamorph progenitus xenomorph thing. The other is Mark's comment, and the third is, is the comment I made on chat. The comment I made basically says that I think the exponential growth takeoff for AI agents is when they engage in economies. And so mm. AI researchers should definitely be interested in your work so they can understand how game theoretically they might act in an economy, because that's when things will be otherwise quite difficult to track. And yeah. then Mark's comment about the derivatives. I think basically it is more of the same. Essentially, it'll be really interesting to see how they engage in economies. And the third bit about these xenomorphs, like from chats I've had with block science people and the, I actually have had a, a really excited conversation with one of Michael's grad students who seems eager to continue collaborating. There is some understanding they have of structure that can be derived from, they wrote a paper about doing it for LLMs and for traditional neuroscience and also for biology that I think is highly aligned with AGI models and advanced economics models. But yeah, there is something to truly sophisticated mental architectures comprised of small agents that are themselves AIs, but engaged in economies. That's probably something you should be aware of. Yeah. Um, I lost track of whether there was a question in that. But... Yeah, I just, I figured it would make sense to tie this together. If you have any comments, uh, let me know yeah. or questions. Um, or definitely the significance of the significance of AI agents participating in what we would broadly call economic structures, markets, supply chains, the type of thing, institutions, like we, we have recognized that that is a very important thing that we think is, that is underappreciated by most people who are thinking about things like AI safety and also the big AI corporations, mostly. DeepMind maybe, DeepMind take their game theory very seriously. They're world leading in computational game theory. Um, for example, I wrote a blog post, Let's see if I can find, hopefully nothing goes horribly wrong when I tab away. Uh, I wrote a blog post recently, which I can now drop in the chat, send to mm. everyone like that. This was a recent blog post, basically making an argument a bit like this. All right. We're already three minutes over time, so we have to okay. leave it at this. I also shared the Gorg open systems papers from Mark and a few others yeah. here in the chat that I think is also pretty relevant for AI agents and these large scale economies. It's from a while ago, but it's still quite relevant. Okay. Thank you so much, Jules. It was absolutely fantastic. My final question always is how can people help you? You already mentioned the funding request. Is there any way that people can contact you or how will people 
get uh-huh. the, oh, you already put your I'm, email here. Ahead of you. This is the new best way to contact me. On my University of Strathclyde email address, I get 30 emails a day just about random stuff, most of which is junk. So it's easy for me to lose stuff. So this is a new email address where it's much easier to reach me. Awesome. It's dropped here in the chat. And if anyone is listening to this upwards on YouTube and is dying to get in touch with you, they can get in touch with Foresight at Foresight.org and we can hopefully make a connection to you. Thank you so much for joining. That was absolutely fantastic. It's so, so long overdue and hopefully not the yes. last time that we hear from you. And yeah, please let us know if there's any useful updates that should be shared with this group. Thanks everyone for your fantastic questions. Yeah. I've had a really great time with this one and I hope to see you very soon, Jules. Bye everyone.